Isn't all you've been told Don't blink, don't run Don't turn left or turn right Or look straight at the sun My mind's gone in circles I'm trying to fight it Get in these voices Inside to stay quiet Go to the Hey everybody, nice to meet you guys. My name is Sung, and that's me riding in the background. I've learned a lot about the art of carving on a snowboard, and I wanted to share my knowledge and love for the sport with the whole snowboard community. In this video, I'm going to teach you step by step how to carve on a snowboard. If you've never done a single carve in your life before, but are looking for a super in-depth, all bases covered guide to help you master carving this season, this is THE video you want to watch. And before we get into it, enjoy some clips of my writing. And just as a heads up, this video is going to be complex with a lot of detail. There's going to be a lot of information here, but I consider this video to be the complete and comprehensive guide to beginner carving. This isn't a 5 minute quick tips video, and while there's nothing wrong with those types of videos, this is the video you watch if you seriously want to get into carving and practice everything we talk about over the course of a few days. I've carved and taught carving for a while now and understand most of the small but nagging issues that beginners have that make a huge difference. So I'll do my best to be as detailed as possible so there's no confusion about what you, as a beginner, have to do to dig your first trenches in the snow. Make sure you're able to perform skidded turns comfortably on a smooth blue run if you want to learn how to carve. Being able to do skidded turns consistently on blue runs gives you the necessary foundational skills needed for the carves in this video. Alright, so without further ado, let's get started. Alright, so what actually is carving? The textbook definition of a carve is a turn where the nose and tail of the ski or snowboard travel the same path in the snow, resulting in a line created by the side cut. That's definitely technically correct, but if you're a beginner, that probably made no sense. It's a lot easier to understand visually, so take a look at this. Basically, a carve is a turn where the toe side or heel side edge of the snowboard digs itself into the snow. If the rider is on an incline, gravity pulls the rider downhill, and the board cuts across the snow in a circle turn, creating a sharp, easily identifiable pencil line behind the rider as it performed the turn. It's pretty easy to identify a correctly performed carve by just looking at the path created by the rider. Take a close look at this line. If the line created by this rider is sharp and clean like this, it's a proper carve. There are absolutely no exceptions to this rule. A turn is either a carve or it is not. If the line isn't a line and looks like a peanut butter spread, it's a skidded turn. And just to be clear, skidded turns are not carves. Remember, skidded turns are your first turns you learned when you first started snowboarding. They're also just as easy to identify as carves, the peanut butter trail that they leave is their key visual trait. Skidded turns aren't bad, and you should be able to perform skidded turns pretty comfortably before trying to do any kind of carve in this video. Let's talk terrain for a bit. Without a doubt, it is easier to carve and learn carving on piste. Think about it, groomed snow is hard and has grooves in it. And as the metal edge of the snowboard slices through the snow in a carve, the hard snow and grooves hold the metal edge into the snow. This is important for learning how to carve because you want to focus on your form, not on how bumpy the snow is on non-smooth terrain. Carving on groomed snow is like gliding on velvet, and there's honestly nothing like it. Another small thing. If you can help it, try to learn how to carve at opening times at your resort of choice, or when the run is mostly empty. It'll save you a headache from having to stop your progress because the hill looks like this. Let's start off with long turns, which are everybody's beginner carves. Long radius, drawn out carves that cover a wide area of space. The general idea is that with long turns we're going to tilt the board on its side, get into the proper body position, 
and ride the side cut all the way throughout the turn. What does it mean to ride the side cut, and what is a side cut? Well, all boards have a side cut, which is the metal arced sides of the board, and a side cut radius, which is the radius of the circle if someone got a marker, traced the arced toe side or heel side of your board on the floor, and followed all the way through and created a circle. Like I said before, for these long turns we're tilting the board and riding the side cut all the way throughout the turn. The side cut and its radius determines the radius of your turn, which is typically around 6.5 to 8 meters for most boards. For this reason, long turns can also be called side cut turns. And of course, this is a video on carving, so the word turn in the phrase long turns is synonymous with carves. Now, I've ridden at Big Snow for most of my snowboarding lifetime, and it's a fairly small run compared to any large mountain. Sorry Big, I still love you. From what I can guesstimate, the length of the main blue run is around 65 to 70 meters, meaning that if performed right, one can perform 4 to 5 half circle long turns, which is a perfect goal to shoot for when you're a beginner carver. At an actual resort, try finding a wide open blue run. Don't try to carve on mellow greens and bunny hills, you won't get enough speed and also annoy other actual beginners trying to learn their first skidded turns. Compared to Big Snow's one run, the blue or steep green run you'll find will probably have a lot more space for more than just four long turns. Provided the snow conditions are right and the hill empty enough, any medium pitch run is prime for learning your first carves. I mean hey, if I learn how to carve in a refrigerator, there's no excuse for space at least at a real resort. You can definitely learn how to do these turns on a real groomed mountain. And for those lucky enough to be riding at Big Snow, well, I guess you can follow exactly what I say in terms of spacing. Now, let's get into what you actually need to do with your body to perform a carve. It's going to get a little nerdy here, shout out to Tommy B, so listen up. The simple version is that you need to get your body and board in the right position to dig in your edge, which will cut into the snow. If done right, the cut will be deep, and gravity will pull you through that established cut to perform a clean circular carve. Now just like skidded turns, there are toe sides and heel sides. What you need to do for a toe side carve is slightly different from a heel side, so we're going to tackle toe sides first. For our purposes, there are three physical requirements for a good carve. The first is having a high edge angle. Edge angle is the angle of the snowboard relative to the snow when tilting it on its heel or toe edge. Having a high edge angle means the board digs into the snow deeper and can handle your body weight and the forces of the carve better. If the edge angle is too low when going down a run like this, a skidded turn occurs because the board's edge isn't dug into the snow enough and instead scrapes across the surface of the snow. If the edge angle is increased and is now high enough, the edge of the board starts to slice and dig into the snow. The whole snowboard edge is in the same shape as the side cut, which is circular, and gravity pulls the rider and the board in a circular carved turn. For our turns, as a general rule of thumb, the higher the edge angle, the less likely you'll slip out of a carve and into the skidded turn, aka the carve has higher stability. The second requirement is a lowered center of mass close to the edge shift this slightly towards the tail. A center of mass that's low to the ground will put more pressure downwards, deepening the cut already made by the high edge angle and increasing the stability of the carve. Now when I say lower center of mass, I don't mean upper body hunched over, which causes you to fall forwards. You can usually achieve a lower center of mass by just bending your knees and getting low. The rider's center of mass should also be shifted slightly a few inches towards the tail of the board, for increased carve stability. Don't jut out your hips like crazy, just shift your hips a few inches slightly towards the tail and it should be enough. The third requirement is a balanced upper body and hips over the edge. The upper body and hips have to be balanced correctly over the edge during a carve, otherwise the rider will just straight up fall sideways into the turn like this. There are a few ways to achieve balance. The way we'll do it is by having an open body where we rotate our upper body and hips 90 degrees counterclockwise or clockwise, depending on whether you're regular or goofy, respectively. When the upper body and hips are rotated like this, it is easy to gain and keep balance over the edge during a carve, because half of your body weight is separated on each side of the snowboard edge, half and half. 
During the carve, your body should always be in this open body position. So to recap, the three requirements for a good carve are 1. High edge angles 2. A lowered center of mass close to the edge and 3. A balanced upper body and hips over the edge. Now it might seem like a lot, but there is a way to satisfy all these conditions at once so that a clean carve can happen. I've been doing it this whole time while talking about the requirements, but I'll go through it in detail and really hone in on the motion. Let's start with the toe side. To start off, you're going to do two things at the same time. You're going to bend your back knee outwards so you get your back kneecap to touch the snow, and you're going to rotate your body 90 degrees towards the heel side. Only focus on your back leg, just ignore your front leg for now. Now when you do these two actions at the same time, you'll feel the back of your board lifting up and the toe side edge digging into the snow. This is good, allow this to happen. Once the upper body and hips are fully rotated at least 90 degrees and your back leg's kneecap is touching the snow and the board completely dug into the toe side, hold the position. From here, we can see that all the requirements for a clean carb are met. One. The board is tilted through the back leg bending, yielding a high edge angle. 2. The rider's center of mass is lowered significantly without hunching over the upper body and is slightly back towards the tail just because the back leg is bent more than the front. And 3. The rider's upper body and hips are balanced 50-50, side to side over the board's edge. From now on, we'll call this form the open body toe side. And if this motion was slightly difficult to do, don't worry. You can practice this motion off the slopes and try this at home if you want. Try it at home a few times and when you're on the mountain, just do it on the flats to get the general feeling of it just for the first few times. Make sure your back kneecap is touching the snow and allow your board to tilt on its toe side. Now we're going to use this form we've just learned in an actual turn. Your first toe sides made from the open body toe side form are going to be turns that are made one at a time so that you can focus on only that one turn. We'll call these turns U-turns because you'll want to go down the slope, perform a carve, and if done right, travel back up the hill. Now before you actually do any of these U-turns, let's talk safety. Here's a diagram of a U-turn. You'll be going down the hill, traversing across the run, and going back uphill a little bit towards the end, hence the name we'll give it, a U-turn. These turns take up a lot of space, so make sure no one is above you or around you to potentially cut you off or in the worst case scenario, hit you. You might have the downhill right of way when you cut in, but no one wants to get into a collision regardless of whose fault it was. When the coast is clear, it's time to perform the U-turn. Start by standing straight up and going directly down the slope. After gaining a bit of speed, quickly get into the open body toe side form and hold it. Remember to open your upper body and hips to bend your back knee extensively. If done correctly, your snowboard edge will dig and lock in quickly, your center of mass low, and open upper body and hips balanced over the edge. Gravity will pull you through the turn, creating your first clean carve across the run and going back up the hill a bit. If you're not sure whether you've made a carve or not, just look at your line behind you. A proper carve always produces a pencil thin line behind the rider, no exceptions. I've adjusted the video slightly so you can see the carved line better. If you performed a carved U-turn wrong, it'll be easy to tell as you'll start performing a skidded turn instead as soon as you try to get your board on edge. Remember, if any part of the turn looks like snow being spread, consider it a failed carve. Be honest with yourself here. Take your time and review your form with these common mistakes that I've gathered here. The first and most common mistake is not bending your back knee and rotating your upper body and hips enough and together. With this open body toe side form, you should be aiming to bend your back knee excessively and touch your back kneecap on the snow, forcing it down if necessary. Your back kneecap should be basically touching and dragging slightly along the snow. Remember, the more your back knee is bent, the higher the edge angle and the deeper the edge digs in and the better the carve. But no matter how much you bend your back knee, it doesn't mean anything if you don't rotate your upper body and hips extensively as well. A lot of beginners aren't used to rotating their bodies outside towards the heel side, 
so they instinctively close and turn their bodies in to be in line with the board by accident. Doing this causes the rider to immediately fall into the toe side every time, so get rid of this habit. To carve, you should rotate your body a lot, at least 90 degrees towards the heel side so that your board and shoulders are basically perpendicular during the carve. Bending your back leg and rotating your body works in tandem to produce a clean carve. One does not exist without the other. So do both and do both aggressively for a clean carve every time. The second mistake is not getting into the open body toe side form quick enough. You want to get into the open body toe side form relatively quickly so that you can achieve a high edge angle fast. This is called having fast edge initiation where you force a high edge angle from the start of the carve and maintain it all the way throughout the turn, keeping the carve stable all the way through. When I do the open body toe side, it takes me about under a second to get into the proper form, which is why my toe side carves are staple to boot. Trying to settle into the open body toe side form slowly yields low edge angles from the start. And remember, low edge angles means skidded turns and failed carves. You should always try to achieve high edge angles from the get-go by getting into the open body toe side quickly and aggressively. Bend your back leg and open your upper body and hips together and fast. The third mistake is accidentally using ankle tension. This one isn't easy to catch, but don't tension or use your ankles at all when you perform these U-turn carves, or any beginner carves for that matter. Well, what do I mean by ankle usage? Well, when you stand on your toes on flat ground, you're going to use your ankles to raise yourself up. And you also stretch your ankles out using that same motion and muscles. This ankle usage is actually what allows you to make skidded turns, where you primarily use your ankles to twist the board to control your skidded turning. That's great and all, but when it comes to carving, this ankle usage is detrimental. If you put tension into any of your ankles and use them like you do while skidded turning when you try to carve, the movement of your knees bending isn't properly translated into the board due to your ankles interfering. So avoid using or even thinking about your ankles. Instead, when you perform U-turns, allow your body weight to press and sink into the tongue of your back boot, and don't use your ankles at all. Just press and hold your weight into your back boot's tongue, press your back kneecap into the snow, and allow the board to edge up. Your body weight will properly transfer into the edge, creating a stabler carve, one where you don't skid out and you'll travel back uphill correctly. The fourth mistake is that you might be putting way too much weight towards your tail and accidentally jutting out your hips as a result. When you carve, it is true that you should have your weight not centered, but slightly towards your tail to give you the most stability. But remember, with this open body toe side form, our back leg is bent much more than the front. Just by virtue of that, our weight is already shifted towards the tail slightly. No need to contort your body and jut out your hips towards the tail of the board while you carve, which just looks terrible and messes up your carved turn. This is what toe side U-turns look like when jutting out the hips, which is wrong, And this is what toe side U-turns look like without jutting the hips out sideways, and instead rotating them outwards correctly. This is what you should be looking for. If I'm completely honest, I don't really think about weight distribution at all when I carve. I bend my back leg to the snow, turn my upper body and hips, and let the form do the work for me. So don't jut out your hips. The fifth and final mistake is not managing your speed properly. When you start the U-turn, you go downhill straight for a few seconds before actually starting the carve to gain some speed. Obviously, the longer you go straight downhill, the more speed you have. You need to find the direct sweet spot for speed. Start the carve with too little speed, and you'll just fall over when you get into the open body toe side form. Start the carve with too much speed, and no matter how good your form is, your board's edge just can't hold all of your momentum and speed. You'll chatter the carve like seen here, where your board chatters across the snow, before you fall down on your face, or worse. So, take your time and experiment with how far you go downhill to find the right medium speed. It shouldn't take that much time to dial in how fast you need to go downhill for a proper carve. And I know that the term medium speed is really arbitrary and unique to each rider and setup, so try experimenting with the timing with going down the hill in the initial part of the U-turn. The less time you go downhill, the slower you go, 
The more time you spend going downhill, the faster you travel in the whole U-turn. Find your sweet spot. Alright, that covers all of the most common mistakes I've seen with beginner toe sides. Before moving on into the next part of the video, try to master your toe side U-turns first. Make sure to be honest with yourself on whether you're making a skidded turn or a carve. I've said this many times and I'll say it again. A proper carve is pencil line thin from start to finish, no exceptions. When you perform your first U-turn carves, take a look back at the path you've created. If your turns still look like peanut butter spread, take a look back at this video and correct your mistakes. I recommend recording yourself as possible and cross comparing your footage with mine. Remember, the two most important parts of the toe side are back legs bent to the snow and upper body and hips rotated outwards towards the heel side. Once your open body toe side U-turns are absolutely perfect, you can move on. Congrats! Now that you've mastered the toe side U-turns, let's learn heel side U-turns. For the heel side, most of what was said for the toe side is exactly the same for the heel side, including how you need to get into the open body position to initiate the turn. However, there are a few key differences that we'll need to discuss first. On the toe side, what happens is that when you bend your back knee, your body weight presses into your boot tongue and binding ankle strap. If your gear has stiffness, your gear will resist bending and edge up the board on its toe side. On heel side carves, however, what happens is that we lean backwards and press our body weight into the high backs of our bindings. The high back presses into the rest of the binding, which is attached to the rest of the board, and the binding lifts up and edges the board on its heel side. This happens on all types of turns, skidded or carved. When we carve, however, we're going to utilize the same open body stance we used on the toe side, with a few changes. To practice the open body position on heel side on the flats, start with the board flat on the ground. Lean very slightly backwards to get your weight onto the high back and to initiate the edge angle, and at the same time perform the open body technique, back leg bent and opening the upper body and the hips towards the heel side once again. The main difference of course is that on the heel side open body stance, you can't bend your back kneecap to the snow. You're not supposed to. Just bend your back leg more than your front and turn your upper body and hips towards your heel side. And of course, don't lean too much backwards or else you fall flat on your back. Now that you've got the general heel side open body form down, time to perform some heel side U-turns. Now before trying heel side U-turns on the slope, compared to the toe side where the rider is facing into the turn like you can see here, on the heel side turn, the rider is natively facing outwards the turn, like here. This changes one big thing. Controlling speed on your heels is a little harder than on your toes, since now you're balanced on your heels instead of your toes, whereas on your toes you have the support of your boot tongue. This means you'll want to go a little slower on your heel side U-turns than on your toe side U-turns to maintain the carve stability. With that in mind, it's time to perform the heel side U-turn. Start facing down the hill, and once you've picked up just a bit of speed, get into the signature open body heel side form you practice on the flats. Back leg bent, and hips, upper body, and now your eyes all turn toward your heel side, even up behind you. Now that you're actually moving, when you lean backwards, you won't just fall on your back like you did on flat ground, you'll stay balanced, so you can lean slightly backwards without worry. Your edge will dig in and stay settled in better as you attempt your first heel sides. You'll initiate a clean carve and ride up back the hill if completed successfully. Congrats, you've learned how to do a heel side carve. You might be a bit confused. Is that it for heel sides? Well, that's really it. Since you already know how to do the open body stance on toe sides, heel sides are just a matter of performing the open body stance and leaning backwards to get your board on edge with the high back. 
Here are a few common mistakes on heel side that you can fix. The first mistake is not applying enough pressure to your heel side edge. If you find that you're still skidding on the heel side even after adjusting your speed to be a little less, try applying more pressure on the edge by bending your back leg and especially digging your back heel in consciously a little more. This will deepen the snowboard's edge into the snow and provide more stability. The second and most widely overlooked mistake for heel sides is not taking your field of vision into account. I mentioned this earlier, but there's also one more thing to consider when learning heel side U-turns, your field of vision. Let me explain. Since we're duck stanced, meaning we ride facing purely in one direction only, on the toe side, the body is already facing into the center of the turn, allowing the rider to look across the run during the toe side carve to see if anyone's coming or for any potential dangers. However, on the heel side, the rider is facing outside the turn and physically can't turn themselves completely 180 degrees to face the center of the turn. This means that if you're not consciously looking across the run on your heel sides, you tend to look downhill which actually prevents you from being able to see where you're going. Remember, avoid accidents at all costs. More importantly though, you also accidentally lock and limit your upper body in mid-torso's range of motion unconsciously when you don't look in the proper direction. Not looking in the direction of motion on the heel side causes you to miss out on just a little bit of upper body and mid-torso rotation, which actually provides a little bit of better balance and stability. The fix? On your heel sides, just turn your head with your upper body and hips and try to look almost up the hill behind you. You'll gain a bit more range of motion on your upper body, giving you a boost in stability and visibility on all of your heel sides. This might seem like a small fix, but for a lot of people it's actually the biggest thing that makes or breaks a solid heel side. At this point, you should be pretty good with toe side and heel side U-turns and be able to do them whenever you need to. Now, it's time to put them together with transitions, the connecting piece of heel sides and toe sides. You've probably already jumped the gun and tried combining the two, which is great. For those of you that haven't, transitions are the link between heel sides and toe sides. After performing a toe side, you want to transition directly into a heel side and into another toe side and into another heel side and so on and so forth. Transitioning for most is quite easy, but as a formality, let's go over how to transition between turns and how we can perform them even better. Take a look at this diagram of a typical long turn run. It's a combination of toe sides and heel sides connected together through transitions. The red lines represent heel side and toe side turns. The thick blue line is the area you want to perform the transition in, which is at the end of each toe side and heel side. The long black line in the middle is called the fall line, which is an imaginary line which is the direct middle of the path created by your turns if the slope is perfectly groomed. Assuming all of the turns you make are the same size, as you can see, all transitions happen very close or at the fall line. You can see how relevant practicing U-turns is. Just copying and pasting the section of the U-turn where the rider is actually carving and putting them together with transitions results in a series of turns. In a normal run, just perform the exact toe sides and heel sides that you've practiced with the U-turns, but connect them with transitions in the middle. Now you know where to do transitions, let's actually learn how to do one. Transitions are probably the simplest thing to learn. At the end of a turn, just slightly lean your whole body over the midline of the board, which is the middle of the board from tip to tail, from inside of one turn into another. From heel to toe, you start leaning slightly backwards at the end of the heel side, then lean forward slightly into the toe side to start the toe side. And from toe to heel, you do the opposite. It's pretty simple to learn and takes no time at all. Now remember, this is a video on carving, meaning you should try to avoid skidding your transitions. One big mistake I see is that people understand that they have to shift their weight towards their back leg during the turn and dig in their edge for a stable carve. But in trying to do this, they accidentally counter-rotate their upper and lower body and move their back leg during the transition and start skidding their turn. This immediately ruins the carve. Remember, just use your body weight shifting over the midline of the board, instead of moving your back foot and risking skidding the start of the carved turn. Here's something you probably haven't thought of. 
In terms of the upper body and torso, you can transition those as well. I've emphasized how important it is to keep your body open throughout the turn, but what about when you transition? Ideally, to truly master long turns, one should close the body every transition and keep it in line with the board, then open it again during the turn, close it again during the transition, etc. Visually, this looks very nice. The body opening and closing during the turns and transitions give off the appearance of having a smooth upper body and a lot of control over your turns. However, if focusing on the upper body movement combined with everything else is just too much to think about during a run, just keep the body always open. In terms of stability and turn integrity, there's really no problem in keeping the body always open throughout the whole run. It just looks a little stiff when viewed from a third party. Then, after getting better at everything else, just come back and add the upper body rotation pattern into their long turn runs. Open the body during the turn, and close it again during the transition. It's great opening and closing the body correctly with the right pattern, but it's not like there's a major visual or impactful stability difference, at least for now. If you want to set up good habits for advanced carbs later on though, I would recommend focusing on having the upper body rotation down pat. It'll come in handy later on. And that's about it for transitioning. If you can perform U-turns on toe sides and heel sides, and chain them together with transitions, you're good to go. Now that you can perform a run from top to bottom decently with transitions, the last aspect of long turns that I'd like to talk to you about are basic speed mechanics and carbs, how you can manage your speed manually through your riding. And while this is a video on basic carbs, speed mechanics apply to every size and type of carb, and are extremely important to learn for advanced carbs later on. Take a look at this diagram here, a series of semicircular, or half circle, long turns. In a carved run, a rider gains speed during the turn where the board is pointing down the hill. This is represented by the red sections of the diagram. When one starts going sideways or traversing across the run, which happens to be during the transition, some speed is actually lost. This is represented by the blue section. So during a proper carved run, in the turn, speed is gained, while during the transition, speed is lost. Now, compare this diagram to these two here, featuring turns that are skinnier, not half circles anymore, and closer to the fall line. You can see that in the second, and especially the third diagram, the blue sections where the rider is traversing across the run and supposed to be losing speed are much smaller or almost non-existent compared to the first diagram. This means that the rider doesn't lose enough speed at the transitions, and as a result, picks up more and more speed each turn, speed that beginners usually can't control. In the third diagram, the rider is hardly traversing across the run, and in terms of speed is going just as fast as if they were going straight down in a line. Basically, as a rule of thumb, the fatter or further from the fall line the turns are, the more circular and the more speed lost during each transition, meaning the rider will go generally slower. And the smaller the arc length or the skinnier or closer to the fall line the turns are, the faster the rider will go. And this is where the relevance of these speed mechanics comes in, speed control as a beginner carver. As a rider, you're able to determine how fast to go in a carved run by making your turns more circular by drawing them out to go slower, or go faster by making your turns skinnier. And while going fast sounds cool and fun, going fast is actually the worst thing you can do when trying to learn how to carve. When you're going too fast and try to perform a carve, the edge of the snowboard either won't dig into the snow, or if the edge is already settled in, will jump out of the snow because there's too much momentum and speed for the edge to hold. No matter how good your form is, at a certain point if you're going too fast, you'll either be forced to skid out of the turn, or straight up fall and wash out. If you notice the clips being shown now, the first run was a run with half circles, where I can carve all the way through thanks to my speed being managed well. The ones after though are runs where I'm making skinnier turns, and you can see as my turns get skinnier, the faster I go, and the messier the turns. And this isn't because I'm purposely skidding, it's just I'm forced to slarve and skid to prevent myself from falling because there's just too much speed for me to handle. So what can you take from all this? In the end, go slower by making half circle turns on purpose to lose speed on each transition by cutting across the run instead of going downhill all the time and only gaining speed. 
Not only is going slower going to allow you to keep your edge in the snow and maintain the carve, the fact that your turns are fatter and have more travel distance means that you'll have more time to settle into the right body form, which is crucial for learning too. Slow down and focus on your form and not your speed. And that's it with the technical instruction. It was a lot, right? I wasn't lying when I said this guide would be comprehensive. But it isn't over yet. This video wouldn't be a complete carving guide without a section on... Oh! I've mentioned this a few times earlier, but one heavily important aspect of carving is safety. Snowboarding is a dangerous sport. As a carver taking up a lot of space and going decently fast on their turns, you have the responsibility to yield and avoid collisions at all costs, whether you're starting a run or are in the middle of one. When you're on top of the hill to start a run, look downhill for people in your potential path. Then, if the slope downhill is clear, look left and right to see if there are any people dropping in. If there are no people then, you're safe to go. If you're performing U-turns and stop in the middle of the run, look uphill and downhill and sideways to see if there are any riders in your general vicinity. Only if there is no one in your way or potential path should you perform the U-turn. Whether you're an experienced or beginner carver, do not try to carve and weave in and out between riders. This is extremely dangerous because while you might have control over your riding, that random beginner that you plan to pass 10 feet under you might randomly fall sideways and their head right into the nose of your board. Any collision, no matter how small, risks damage to your gear, which sucks, but if you're going fast enough and you hit a rider, helmet or not, that's a serious injury and a potential hospital trip, an accident that could have been avoided with simple patience. There's also the mental focus aspect of safety. Let's say you're really focused on trying to open your body on the toe side U-turn. In that moment, your general spatial awareness goes way down, preventing you from avoiding a collision. And especially if you've been in a bad collision before, if there's anyone remotely around you or in your path while carving, your focus quickly shifts away from maintaining your form to not hitting the person around you, likely causing you to skid out and pull out of the carve. In the end, just wait for the people around you and downhill to you to disappear, then start a carved run where you can focus on your carving in peace. So as always, stay spatially aware, patient, and safe. Alright, enough with the safety stuff. For the final section, I'll talk gear. Basics you need to know to up your carving game. Technically, you can carve with most setups, but having a carving-oriented setup can facilitate your carves a lot. The most important board spec for carving is your board's waist width, which is the distance from the toe side to the heel side in the direct middle of the board. For any and every board, park or all mountain or carving, if the waist width is too narrow or your feet are too big for your board, you won't be able to do higher level carves. If your board is ridiculously narrow, you won't be able to do any kind of carves. But why? The greatest problem in carving is toe and heel overhang, with the toes of your boots and your binding heel cups along with the heels of your boots hang over the edge of your board. This is no good. When carving, there's a phenomenon called boot out. When tilting the board to high edge angles for a carve, if there's too much overhang, your toes or binding heel cups and boot heels scrape the snow. And this is terrible for carving because during a carve, the only thing that should be touching the snow is the snowboard metal edge, which holds and balances all the weight and forces of the rider and the turn when it's dug into the snow. Once the toes or heels touch the snow, Sole pressure is taken off the board's edge, causing the rider to fall over on their toe or heel side, hence boot out. You tilt the board to high edge angles for a deeper carve, but the board isn't wide enough and the toes and heels touch the snow and you fall. The easiest way to address the boot out issue is to get a board with a larger waist width. It's not like we can change the size of our feet, so for all riders a wider board will reduce overhang and increase carving potential. I have a Burton Custom X 2021, which has a waist width of 25.2 cm for a size 156. It's a nice stiff all-mountain board for sure, but just look how much overhang there is on both the toes and heels when I put my boots in with step-ons. I love my Custom X, but it can't lay trenches like my main carving board, a custom-made Donick Napton Twin with a waist width of 29.5 cm, designed by the legend himself, of course. 
With this extra wide board, I clearly have no overhang. In fact, I can tilt the board over 90 degrees and not have either my toes or heels touch the snow, meaning when I carve, I get no boot out, the highest edge angles, and really deep turns. Now, you don't have to get a custom made Donic board to get a few extra centimeters on your waist. There are plenty over the counter wide boards that you can get with wider waist width than normal boards. Even a centimeter or two wider of a waist width makes a huge difference in toe and heel overhang reduction and getting deeper carbs. Some boards I've personally ridden that aren't custom made Donex and I can personally attest to for carving ability are the Rye Twin Pig, the Never Summer Proto FR, and the LipTech Orca. The Rye Twin Pig is a volume shifted, downsized board, which also happens to have some of the widest waist width I've ever seen on an over the counter board. Here's the waist width chart for reference. Compared to my 156 Custom X, which has a waist width of 25.2 cm, a 154 Twin Pig has a waist width of 26.8 cm. There is also the War Pig and the Super Pig, but I choose the Twin Pig thanks to its almost all camber profile, which is the best for carbs. Remember, this one is volume shifted, so you'll want to downsize 3 to 6 cm compared to your typical board. The Never Summer Proto FR is another board I've ridden that can lay trench if you know how to control it, specifically the X sizes, as seen on this chart here. It's a directional board and also features triple camber, which makes them more butterable, but the extra wide waist width allows them to dig trench harder than most boards anyway. The LipTech Orca is another great board for carbs. It features an extra wide waist width compared to other normal boards. It's also directional and volume shifted with corresponding directional triple camber and bonus magnet traction built into the side cut. Meaning, this thing eats ice for breakfast and if you know how to carve at least decently, icy conditions are going to be no problem for you. Bindings are also an important factor for boot out, particularly on the heel side. Most bindings have this large hoop on their heel side, meaning that if you tilt your board too much on your heel side, boom, you boot out. If you can see that there's clearly more overhang on the heel side than the toe side, which is usually the case with most bindings, you can try messing with the binding base plates to adjust the whole binding closer to the toe side to reduce the heel side overhang. Try to keep overhang equal on both toe side and heel side if possible. You can also invest in bindings with no heel cups at all like the ones I use, which are called rear entry bindings. These rear entry binding types don't have a heel cup, but instead use a sturdy wire to transfer force from the high back into the base plate. So, no annoying heel cups means that there's almost no heel side overhang compared to a classic binding. This means unlocking deeper, higher edge angle heel side carbs, and combined with my ultra wide Donic board, I practically have no overhang at all on the heel side when using a rear entry binding, which allows me to dig trenches like no one else. The two rear entry binding options I've personally used and approve of are Flow Bindings, which are the brand I use, and SP Mountain Bindings. Both of these bindings feature a rear entry system and no heel cups, meaning you unlock deeper heel sides if you use these. I personally use the Flow NX2CX Fusion models because the sturdiness and stability I get from the metal chassis allows me to drive the carbs better. SP Mountain Bindings are also an amazing option because they're like flows, but lighter and just as responsive. Remember, the less overhang, the less booting out, the higher the edge angles, and the stabler and better the carbs. For higher level carbs, getting a wider board or various other heavy gear adjustments is almost mandatory, which I'll talk about later in a purely gear-oriented video. Another crucial mistake is not having stiff boots and bindings. Stiff boots and bindings are great for carving because they are responsive, meaning that all the knee bending and subtle motions made with your body are properly transferred through the tightness of your boots and bindings and into the board. Having too soft gear will cause movement to be lost in the softness of the gear, and you'll be confused on whether the reason you can't carve is you or your gear. Stiffness is important for toe side carves, mainly because it prevents ankle deflection. Remember for the open body toe side form, the rider has to bend their back knee so that their back kneecap hits the snow and the board digs into the toe side as a direct result. If the rider's boots or bindings are too soft, the tongue of their back boot will deflect too much, meaning that they can bend their back leg all the way down without having the board lift up from the back and dig into the toe side. As a result, edge angulation can't be achieved 
and carving on toe sides becomes difficult. Try to opt for mid to high stiffness boots and bindings when trying to learn how to carve to make your toe sides a lot better. On heel side carves, maximum forward lean on the bindings can help. Forward lean is an adjustment on almost all bindings where the native angle of the high back is increased to be more forward. Maximum forward lean isn't mandatory, but helps immensely with knee bending. If this forward lean is maxed out, the rider is forced to be in a slightly crouched position with their knees, even when they're standing straight up. This is massively useful. As the rider performs a heel side, since both their knees are already pre-bent, they don't have to work as much to bend the required amount of knee bending and backwards leaning especially to establish a high edge angle for a stable heel side carve. So adjust your forward lean to the max and your heel sides will get slightly easier. And that's it. That wraps up this video on how to perform your first carves. Thank you so much for sticking around till the end. This is the updated version of my first carving video, so thank you to those who watched it again. In terms of future plans for this channel, I'm still planning to make a comprehensive guide on boots, board, and binding characteristics and how they affect carving, basically a carving gear oriented video. I've already made a few videos on tuning your board's base and edges, but if you liked how deep I was going into the gear in this video and want more stuff about gear tech, subscribe, turn on notifications, and keep your eyes out. For the next carving instruction video, I'll teach you some advanced techniques to double the amount of turns you can make on any given run. So if you can only make 5 turns max on your local mountain's blue run, I'm going to help you increase it to 10. It sounds too good to be true, but trust me, these are the high level techniques I use to achieve these kind of turns on the daily all the time. In the meantime, go practice and master your first carbs. Don't forget to subscribe, like the video, and to follow my Instagram for more content and to stay notified about everything. Alright, that's it for now. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.